Uh, so I'm so excited to start part three of our online CAP conference today. Um, we have Amy St. Arnaud of Open Door Veterinary uh, Support, opening the door to access to veterinary care, and um, she'll be talking with us today. Amy is a business partner in two full-service veterinary clinics, a community pet care clinic in Ohio and Open Door Veterinary Care in North Carolina that have built a financially sustainable business model for providing access to veterinary care and removing barriers. She offers a mentorship program for nonprofit organizations and private veterinary practices that want to replicate this business model in their own communities. Um, so Amy, I want to welcome you to the online CAP conference today. And um, I look forward to learning all about what you have to share with us today. Hello, thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Yes, you sound fantastic. Excellent. Okay, then I'm just going to jump in because I have so much to share and I talk really fast. So I apologize in advance for that. <laughs> um, so access to care is an issue we're hearing a lot about lately and for good reason, because this is an issue that is not only right here right now, but it's going to be even bigger in the future. And not, I don't want to depress you early on your Sunday morning, um, but I did just kind of want to start out with what the reality is. And part of that is that you know, 80% of people are living paycheck to paycheck now. And we have 59 million pets that are living in households that make under $20,000 a year. Of those, 29 million pets are living in families that are getting SNAP, the Nutritional Assistance Program. And we have people who, 50% of people, not people who are the ones that are living in households under 20,000, 50% of people in general are having trouble accessing $400 for an emergency vet bill. And just think about in your own life. I mean, I know for me, if I had to get $400 or I had to get a $1,500 or $2,000, I'm going to be in trouble. And so, and of course, vet care is due up front. So this is going to be an ongoing issue, particularly with COVID, particularly with the economy. And one thing we don't often think about in access to care is how community cats are affected. But right now, we still have 70% of the animals that are dying in shelters are cats. And we know there's not enough surgical capacity. So we're encouraging people to start return to field programs and to do bigger TNR programs, which is great, but there's not enough surgical capacity. The spay neuter clinics are down in numbers because of COVID. They had to shut down for a period of time. And it's hard to find veterinarians right now. We're having to cut our numbers because of COVID. So a lot of times we're running into that there's just not enough capacity for caretakers to get the surgeries done and to get the cats that are up for adoption out and fixed. So we need to increase our capacity. So access to care for community cats is going to be a really big issue for us to think about. Okay, for some reason I cannot get my slides to go forward. This is my great tech. Oh, there we go. Okay, hold on. All right. So, and what we see with this is this is kind of this is from vet billing, and this is this is called the vicious circle. And what happens is, and you can apply this also with community cat caretakers and spay neuter clinics as well. But the pet, pet owner can't afford upfront the cost of of the care. So. For most veterinarians, they're going to put them over to care credit and a third party financing. But if they don't get care credit, the owners declined, which happens only 40% of people are actually approved for third party financing, such as care credit. So now the vet is though reluctant to offer any other type of in-house payment plans because they've gotten burned in the past where they haven't gotten paid and rightfully so. That's a big issue for them. This is their livelihood. So there's no other viable options for the pet owner. So now the pet owner's upset feels angry, they're going online, writing negative reviews, or saying the vet only cares about money, they don't care about anything else. Now the vet's upset and angry, they feel hurt, they feel taken advantage of, and we already know that there's a high risk of suicide in veterinarians. This is a very difficult field to be in, so now they're really upset, so now they want to help even less. So now the pet owner, though, has very limited options. So what are they going to do? They're either going to have to surrender that pet to a shelter, which now is faced with having to place a pet that already had a home into another home, which is stressful for that pet and that family. They either don't treat, that pet goes without, or they end up euthanizing, and that becomes an economic euthanasia because they couldn't afford the treatment. So this isn't this everybody suffers. The owner suffers, the relation, the vet suffers, but most of all, the pet suffers. So this is kind of what we're stuck in right now is the cycle, and we see it being played out, and we see that you know so many people are just relying on GoFundMe's right now when this is not what we want to be in. 
So imagine, this is what we're starting to see with Haas and with a lot of the, this new community-based effort. Imagine where the animal shelter has intervention at the time of surrender. They have a hotline you can call or right there as you come to surrender your animal. They have options to help you keep your animal. And they also are having preventative outreach in the community. And meanwhile, private practice veterinary clinics are having easy payment plans. They're partnering with the nonprofit to provide a medical fund so that animal isn't going without care. And spay neuter clinics are increasing community cat surgeries and increasing their number that they're doing. And then we bring in the human healthcare piece and that they're providing referrals and they're providing support because sometimes they're the, they're the first one who's getting the call about the cats, the outdoor cats, or getting the call about the number of cats in a home that need to be fixed. So this may sound like utopia and like, well, yeah, that's great, but that's not reality, but it's becoming reality. And we're starting to see that what is really needed is more capacity and a collaborative model, but it also needs to be sustainable. So we need to open spay neuter and full service clinics, expand existing ones and add and add, and add more capacity for community cats and make sure that they're sustainable. That's the really big piece to this is the sustainability because we can go out and do a lot of this great work, but if we don't have the ongoing funds and we're seeing right now, a lot of grant funds are shifting away from spay neuter, we've got to have a sustainable model so that we can continue to do this and reach the, the populations most in need. So that's one of the things that we tried to do with ours is when we opened up our clinic, my background is in high volume nonprofit spay neuter clinics, but we wanted to see if we could open two for profit private practices and see, could we still make it sustainable, make revenue and not have to turn people away by building partnerships and collaborations. And I'm excited to say in both our clinics in Ohio and in North Carolina, we are doing that. We actually are making money and we're making sure that we're increasing access to care and we're removing barriers to care. So now what we're trying to do is show others how to do that. So we started a nonprofit to do this and there's going to be online programs as well as virtual and on-site. So if you are a clinic that, if you wanna open a clinic or you already have one open and you just need somebody to look at your spay neuter, your flow or how things are going or your budget, or you're, you really wanna start adding on to what you're doing, that's something that we can con consult with. Um, so we're doing it for nonprofits and for private practices. Um, so I'd love to just get a real quick poll here, Stacy. if you could just help me. I'd love to get an idea of how many people right now are operating either a spay neuter clinic or a full service clinic right now, just to see what the audience looks like. Sounds great. Uh, here you go. Are you involved with running a clinic? Yes, spay neuter only. Yes, spay neuter and full service. No, I would like to be. So we have a 22% say uh, spay neuter only. 3% say yes, spay neuter and full service. 49% say no, and 26% say I would like to be. Excellent. Okay. Well, great. Because what I wanted to do is really get an idea of, of who's in the audience in terms of giving you ideas and things that you can do from any level, whether you're operating full service, whether you're operating spay neuter, or whether you're not a provider at all, but you would like to work with the providers to add on programming. So let's kind of jump into some of that stuff. So with the spay neuter clinic, one of the things we see, and I don't know if you're all experiencing this as well, but the spay neuter clinics are just really overwhelmed right now. Some of them are booked out three to six months. They can't keep up. And they're really, the, the great news is, is a lot of caretakers are wanting to use them for surgeries, but they're becoming so overwhelmed that a lot of them are ending up limiting instead of increasing access for community cats. So really, this is a big thing we need to focus on with clinics is how can we increase this capacity? And one of the big things is really, I believe in offering walk-in appointments for community cats. Or if you can't do that because it's just becoming too much, offering specific days and really trying to offer it at days that make sense. We know a lot of caretakers are going to trap on weekends versus the middle of the day. So trying to offer days that work around our caretaker schedules and really be thoughtful about them. And treating our large trappers, the trappers who bring in a lot of animals, as we call them a volume client, where letting them book their own days, their own appointments, letting them be a little bit more flexible in terms of when they drop off 
their the cats instead of making a bee they have to be there at 7 30 in the morning and they have to pick up at this time because again people are doing this on their own time their own you know their, their own dime and so we really want to try and encourage them to come in and do this so in Asheville we have two trappers that can easily bring in 20 cats a day we know they're reliable we know they're going to show up so we're going to allow them to schedule like that so that they can go out and get their day done and get the cats in it's really important as a spay neuter clinic that we look at our pricing and our protocols for community cats because it's really hard to be able to afford a full price for community cats so we always try to look at can the clinics give subsidies to reduce that price down and also looking at protocols in terms of how we do things and i do have a lot of great examples of these if any of you are interested also aspca pro has some great um, documents for community cats if you're looking to run a spay neuter clinic or you already are you want to have different post-op handouts than you give for own cats. You're not going to tell somebody to go check the incision on a community cat in a trap the way you would their own cat periodically. So we have different um, protocols on how we release the cats. We have different pricing. We have different things we do in terms of showing how to do the ear tip and how to standardize that. So we want to make sure that clinics are set up to have really good protocols for how you're handling community cats. Are you going to do flank space or are you not? There's going to be a lot of questions like that that you need to answer in your clinic and make sure you have ready for your team. And another great thing that a spay neuter clinic can do is offer a trap loan bank. And I don't know if any of you do this already, but this is something that the spay neuter clinic I started did. It has about 100 traps and about five um, drop traps to be able to loan out. And it works really well. They actually just use an Excel spreadsheet, but there are some ones that you can use um, for online if you want to have like an actual online um, way of, of marking your traps so that you can have an easy it, it, it's called a easy loan i believe is what it's called is what what uh, one of the groups uses down in florida but offering a trap loan bank can be so helpful for people and you just basically can offer a a fee a 65 dollars refundable deposit that they will get back at the time that they bring the trap back and you can loan it out for a certain amount of time and we actually had little guidelines in terms of what you could use it for you know how to use the trap we would give tips to trappers on how to catch the hard to catch trap cats because what we found is while we had the real hardcore trappers who worked for us we also had a lot of people who were just coming in trying to do the cats in their neighborhood and they really were just trying to help that and that was all they were going to do they weren't going to do more so we wanted to make sure that we made this as easy as possible for them so another great thing that a spay neuter clinic can do or an organization can do is offer a caretaker support network and that is something that we did and we offered them benefits so that if they if we had discounts um, if we got a grant they would get the first discounts if we did cat shelters and got those donated or built them um, we often had a lot of girl scouts who would build the, the cat shelters for us we would give those first and foremost to the people in our caretaker support network if we got food donated we had a separate Facebook page for them where they could network and they could talk to each other. We did regular chat trainings where we showed people how to trap. And then we also would allow them to set up a fund. So if they were um, trying to trap a bunch of cats in one neighborhood and they wanted to get a bunch of donations from their friends and family, they could call them into a fund and we would just take donations in and handle it so they didn't have to handle the funds. And that made it really easy for them. We also had a program we set up called Pay to Spay, where if somebody um, called in and said look you know i'm elderly i'm 90 years old i really just can't do the trapping but i care about these cats we would pay one of our they could pay us the caretaker or the person needing the help would pay we would then pay one of our uh, volunteers to go out and actually do the trapping for that person so it was kind of a nice way to reward our regular trappers but also make sure we were helping people in the community as well if they could afford to pay if they couldn't we'd still get volunteers out there but it might be a two-month wait versus if you paid we could get somebody out there right away so it was a nice option to offer uh, I don't know if you got if you've all heard about this yet but shelter love has a great database that they are offering for free you do not have to be um, use their software, but it is actually being used now to track for community cats. You can track your caretakers, your you could do traps, you could track um, you know where the colonies are. So this is a great way for people to really be able to connect with each other and see where where there's so if you need a feeder because you're going on vacation or hey, is somebody already got this colony? And we actually uh, used a database and it was so funny because we found that there were eight different feeders feeding one colony at a family video and none of them knew each other 
So it was so great to be able to connect them all together because it was such a relief that they knew that they weren't the only one anymore. Um, another thing you can do if you're a spay neuter clinic is a, a kitten shelter diversion program. This is what Operation Catnip does um, down in Florida, where basically they, when people come in and they're trying to say, oh, we found these kittens, we need to surrender them. They say, hey, if you would be willing to keep the kittens until they're old enough and keep them inside, um, then we will actually help you fix them when, when we're ready. And then we're going to look for you to help try to find the adoptive home instead of them having to go into the shelter. But the clinic would actually agree to fix all of these kittens um, and then the mom. And then the people who found them would find them homes. And it ended up keeping about 1,500 cats a year out of the shelter. And this was a great thing that the spay neuter clinic participated in. Um, another thing that is really great is the partnership between nonprofits and private practices. So uh, my clinic, Open Door Veterinary Care, is the private practice in Asheville. We partner very closely with Asheville Humane, who offers a community solutions program. They get about 350 calls a month, and about 150 of those are for vet help. So they actually will pay $150 toward vet costs. They do have a list of what they fund and what they don't. They don't tend to do healthy pet services, but they tend to do more urgent care needs. What is great is Asheville Humane is going out and they're already doing the outreach. They work with the Homelessness Coalition, the Housing Authority, the Veterans Association, and they actually will go out to these areas. So they, there's a housing authority, um, a couple of apartment buildings right behind our clinic. They go out and they do TNR there. And then they'll bring the cats to us for spay neuter or to the local spay neuter clinic. And it's a great way to be able to build that partnership where we can play a piece, but don't have to do it all. So a great thing is that medical fund, because for us, having $150 that we can spend towards a person, we can get a lot of medicine done for $150. So if a nonprofit or an individual can set up a medical fund that says, hey, we're going to cover $150 towards this, and here's the process, and here's how we're going to handle this, and then partners with a, a clinic, that is a great, great partnership. And private practices will be so much more likely to want to work with nonprofits when there's something like this set up that gives them that safety net instead of feeling like the nonprofits are always coming to them asking for something. And this is a great way of them to give something and make it a partnership. And if anybody's interested in the how or wants more information on this, uh, contact me and I can get you the actual specifics of how this is set up. This is an example of kind of the, uh, the kitten diversion program that Operation Catnip does on the spay neuter end. This is it on the private practice end. So Jacksonville Humane actually partners with five private practices and ask them if they will either donate or if not donate, will they discount so that they can do certain things. And they have a list of what they are. They're like spay neuter, deworming, vaccinations. And again, same concept of when people find the kittens, they don't actually have to, um, now surrender them. They actually are getting the care they need at a private practice that they might already work with or that's near their house to be able to get that spay and neuter done and the vaccinations done. And then they can adopt the kittens out with Jacksonville Humane helping support in terms of how they do that. They helped over 1,100 kittens stay out of the shelter last year by doing this. And it is a great way, again, that partnership between the nonprofit and the private practice. And I have all of their information as well. If anybody's interested, they've shared it with us. And one of the things we're working on right now is actually a guide uh, to show private practices how to set up and accept community cats in their practice. Because so often private practices don't even want to take in community cats. They don't even want to see them because they don't know how to handle them. They don't feel it's safe. They don't have the space. And we're really trying to show private practices, you can do this. You can set up a spay day. You can safely handle community cats and sharing some protocols and equipment so that they can easily do this and partner with individual caretakers or with organizations. And one of the things we do, and I said we can do a lot of medicine for $150, is we do what's called incremental care. And that is we take a step-by-step -step approach but to stay within people's budgets because we know that, that trying to come up with $400 for a medical emergency is so difficult. So the first thing we try to do is we ask questions all along the process to find out if right from the get-go when they're on the phone, you know, are, would they be interested in hearing more about our payment plan options? And so if we know that finances are an issue, if they tell us, or if they don't tell us directly, but they're telling us by things they're saying about how they just had a large expense, 
they're concerned about this. They just had a big health scare. That's going to also just tell us um, so that we know that finances might be an issue. So the first thing we're going to really look at is running that test going to change the course of the treatments. And if it's not, we're not going to run that test. We're not just going to go right to the high end and run all the diagnostics to give us something. We're going to start out treating it step by step. And so we might look at, can we treat this symptom first? Can we try this antibiotic? Can we script out a generic med medication? Can we do something at Walmart where it's only $4? Or can we use GoodRx? We're really going to work within their budget. And then from there, we might be able to take on that $150 from Asheville Humane, which is going to help, or work with our in-home, in-house payment plan um, or our stay together fund. We actually offer a fund where we give $1 from every healthy pet exam into a stay together fund. And then we use that for emergent or emergency care. And we allow our vets to have a certain amount from this fund that they can use so that they, they are, get to be part of it in choosing who they're giving the funds to and how they're giving it out and that when they need to, to do the incremental care. So a big piece of what we do at our clinic is a financial triage, because we find that about 10% of our clients can afford our prices as is, which are, are lower under general market price, but then about 80% could afford it if they had just had some level of help, whether it's a voucher, whether it's just they could make the payments over time. And then we find about 10% really need the help, that they, they are going to really struggle to come up to pay the bill, um, even with time. And that's where we really try to use our charitable funds and our stay together fund or the medical fund. But what we found just by offering payment plans at our clinic, and this can be nonprofits can do this, for profits can do this. We, when we offer payment plans and we offer it through vet billing, it's $25 to set it up. We do a soft credit check so it doesn't ding them. And then it's $3 a month. So people who get turned down from care credit or scratch pay, this is a great opportunity for us to, to do and run this in-house. We do this on things like dentals. We'll break it up into four easy plans. Um, we do this on when they know they need a surgery um, that they weren't expecting. You could, so this works so well, and we have found that it's a 95% repayment rate. Even though there's this fear that, it, you're, that people aren't going to pay, people really for the majority do. And for the ones that's the small percent that don't, you have the plan to write that off, but you're able to help 95% of people. And that's just through the payment plans. We also have this pet health savings or a pre-savings where when people need to save up, so if they have a sur or they have a dental or they have a surgery they know they need, we let them put a certain amount each month in so that they might save for something six months down the road. Or they might just decide they want to put some money in ongoing and just keep it there in case they need it, kind of like a rainy day savings fund. But these are two really nice, easy things that we can implement to help people in their time of need. And I can't tell you how much this helps not only the people feel like they have options, but it helps our staff feel like they don't have to turn people away. So I highly encourage you to look into something like vet billing or another service where you can offer these types of things because you'll be amazed how much it can help people just by having that. And we allow financing on so many other things. I mean, you can go finance your car, you can finance a, you know, an outfit, you, but we don't seem to have that in vet care. And one of the interesting things that has come out is that millennials who now are starting to make up the biggest pet owning percent of people want payment plans. They like options. They like technology. So they want to have a lot of financing options and they want to be able to pay uh, text to pay. They want to be able to pay right online. They want it easy. And we have not grown as an industry quite to meet that yet, but we're starting to see that we're going to need to. So this is a favorite topic of mine that I could talk about for hours and hours, um, which maybe I'll have to, to come back and just talk about this next year. But this is something that I really think we're going to need to start to go to in this industry to be able to offer. And the other thing that's great about these pet savings plans is it's perfect for the spay-neuter discussion. So as we do the last set of vaccines, we can then say, or that we're on the second set, we can say, hey, we'd like you to start thinking about saving money for your spay neuter. They can put money aside, and then when it's time, they're ready to book that spay neuter. The other interesting thing that's coming up is a big barrier to, in to increasing access to care is transportation. 
So we're actually doing a pilot with Uber right now, and we're piloting with five different organizations across the country who are testing it for us. And we hope to bring this then nationwide, where basically an organization will be able to go onto Uber and they will have a dashboard and they will be able to either pay for all of or part of a person's trip to the vet. And the person will now be able to go with their pet to the vet, which is so great because a lot of times they can't always go, it's just the pet goes on their own. This way they'll be able to go. And Uber will automatically know because you're using the dashboard and you're setting it up um, that they'll have a pet friendly driver, they'll know what they need to bring. Um, and what's great is they're actually even thinking through things that if it's in an area that doesn't have a lot of a great internet connection, it's a really rural area, you can download a coupon. All you have to have is a phone to be able to um, uh, get know that the driver's coming. You don't have to be able to have the app. The, the organization can book it for them and handle all of that. And then the organization will just get billed once a month for whatever they spend on this. So we're really excited about this. And this is something we hope to have going in a couple of months nationwide. But I think in the meantime, while we don't have Uber, I think spay neuter clinics providing transports and allowing from outside areas to have community cats, I think is really important. And another really important partnership we've talked about kind of having the nonprofit and the private practice, but having the human health care, having the social workers, having the home health care aides. And a great thing that we can do with there to help keep pets in homes is offer basic pet care. We can do pop up clinics and we can work with housing authorities, Section 8 housing, senior housing, anywhere where human health care providers are providing human health care, we can go and we can provide vaccine clinics to help keep pets in homes or to provide the spay neuter so that they can stay. We can provide trapping days. And so one of the things that I think is a great thing to do is to provide, I'm seeing a lot of groups do this right now, is providing a pet resource guide. And this is something an individual can do for their community, but putting a list of all the resources to help, whether it's temporary boarding, whether it's helping trapping, whether it's helping with low cost euthanasia, spay neuter, putting that out there, and then getting it out beyond animal welfare. So we actually took our guide that we wrote, and we gave it to our, if you have a 211 or a 311 system where people can call for resources, and we made sure that they had this on their system so that they would know who, when people were calling in for resources, where to refer. And then we also reached out to social workers and found out that there was a Facebook group, and we asked them to post this there. So it's a great way to start to get it beyond just us. And speaking of social workers, it's really important to integrate in. So um, this is this picture is one of a home health care worker who was concerned. She saw 50 cats that were turned loose from an apartment. The owner had died and nobody knew what to do. And they just turned the cats loose. And she she knew I, I need to call somebody. And luckily, she made a call. She got two local groups. They were able to go get all of the cats and get them into homes and foster homes and get them fixed. But it's because she did that. Now, how great when all of our home health care workers and our social workers know who to call and what to do in that situation, because not everybody's going to know that. So if we have a support guide, um, that's just going to be even better for us to be able to help more people. Another thing that we can do is get a questionnaire on the homeless census. There's usually a uh, point in time census done to identify home or unsheltered individuals and ask if they have a pet because that's gonna help us really know if we need to go um, help provide services there. So really one of the things we've done is we've integrated a social worker into our private practice and we didn't have the money to do it full time. So we actually went and asked our university and said, is there anybody who needs to have um, an internship? And there was somebody who was going for their master's in social work. And so she's been interning with us. We have her for eight months and she has been great. She helped put together the pet resource guide. She's helped connect us to social workers. She's helped us think about how we can start reaching out on the human end and how they can reach us and we can bridge, we can bridge that. So it's been a really great thing. And from that also, there's another great program called HARP, which is the Hope and Recovery Program. It's an emotional support animal placement. And it's our human hospital and our local humane society, and then our clinic in Toledo have actually all bonded together. And when people have been diagnosed with anxiety or um, mental health issues, they actually can apply to get a pet the Humane Society will help choose the right one for them, place them. They continue to do home visits, make sure the animal's doing well. And then our, my clinic provides the veterinary care. And then the hospital actually also provides 
um, some support in terms of looking in and they helped fund the program. What a great program because they have found that it has helped increase the mental health of the participants in this study so much that they have said they only got up today because they had to feed the cat. So when we see that bond, that is so important and so amazing. And we really need to start thinking just beyond the animal end of it and thinking about the human end of it. So for me, I am really excited about where we're going right now, because I think as a field, it's wide open in terms of how we're going to increase access to care. And there are so many ways to go about doing it. And we're starting to see some really amazing programs that can be replicated across the country. So that was a lot of information. So I'm gonna uh, stop now, but I am happy to talk to anybody offline or provide any resources for anybody who is interested. Fantastic, great presentation. Tons of information though. Um, Amy, if you'd like to turn your webcam on, that would be great. I have a whole page full of questions for you. Oh, great. There, I see you, excellent, okay. So first question, um, actually I have to go to the first page here. Um, I'm just curious, um, why did you choose to go with a nonprofit model versus maybe something more like a, a B Corp or something that had like more of like a socially sustainable business model? Um, what was the, the nonprofit was so you could have those medical funds? Oh, you need to uh, unmute yourself. Did I do it? Okay. Yep. yep. There, okay. So we actually did it as a for-profit. We did not do it as a nonprofit. We did it as a regular private practice because we wanted to eliminate the concern from private practices that we were a nonprofit getting an unfair advantage. So we actually did it as a private practice to show that we can partner with nonprofits who can set up the medical fund to do it with us. So that was our goal was to show others how to do this and spread this across the country because we believe that while nonprofits getting into this and doing more is great, we're never gonna be able to do it all alone. There's 29,000 private practices out there. We've got to engage them. And so that was our goal was how could we show them that we all can play this role together. Excellent. Uh, lots of people are asking for a copy of the pet resource guide. Um, so I don't know if you can send us a, a PDF or something like that, and then we can send that out to the um, attendees just as a model that they can use. Yep. They thought that was like totally awesome. Yeah, I'll send you um, Dallas Animal Services, and then I'll send you ours in Toledo. Excellent, super. Um, why is spay-neuter funding going down when it's so important to continue doing it? You know, that is a big question. And what we're starting to see is a lot of funders are switching more into access to care versus spay neuter because there's a belief that we've done such a great job with spay neuter that we're more in a maintenance mode. And so they're, they're shifting to other areas that they feel are of a, a, a bigger um, unmet need. But for all of us in spay neuter, we know it is still a huge need. And so there's actually a group of us who are getting together who are meeting to discuss how we can make sure that spay neuter is still at the front of access to care because we know that spay neuter is absolutely part of that and we need to increase funding so we're actually meeting to brainstorm and discuss that and some of the big ones like bushby and, and others are involved with that excellent excellent um let's uh, do you have any thoughts around um same day release from surgery. So, um, you know, either male cats, female cats, um, do you have thoughts or do you see certain trends around that? We like to see them held overnight at the clinic one night, if that's at all possible. And so we do encourage clinics to have a separate community cat room and shelving, and we have recommended shelving. Um, but not all clinics are able to do that because they, they may have zoning things as to why they can't. But in that case, we really make sure that the caretaker understands that they aren't just releasing them back out that night. So that they that they have safe place to keep them in a temperature controlled environment. We give um, suggestions on how to release them too, even like not facing the road and you know things like that. So ideally we like to see them overnight or at least the caretaker keeping them overnight. Um, the services that you mentioned for veterinarians to help them better handle community cats, are those resources available or are they coming? So we've written them. We now are just uh, formatting them and make them pretty. So they will be coming. Um, so uh, uh, they will be on our, our open door site. And then we're also working with um, Dr. Levy on some really interesting things around that. So hopefully, uh, probably in the next couple of months. 
Let's talk about vet techs and wages and the fact that vet techs don't get paid a lot of money um, and the fact that it's already difficult to get veterinary technicians. And one of those reasons might be because we're not paying our vet techs well enough. In your practices, do you compensate your vet techs to, at a higher level than, than standard? And maybe if you could share with us, if you know what the going I mean, I know regional issues are different. You know, it's different in New York City than it is in Kansas, maybe, or something like that. But um, in general, you know, what, what the vet techs hourly rates are and maybe what do we aspire to go to? It's a huge issue right now. Finding veterinarians and finding vet techs is like finding a, a unicorn at this point in time. It is so difficult. And so I, we're actually doing a webinar with ASV and AWA coming up to discuss how do we hire more veterinarians. But techs are under undervalued as well. And, and one of the things that we are definitely encouraging people is first of all, use techs to the top of their skill set. A lot of people don't use techs and, and they kind of use them more as just kind of a an assistant and then they get really bored. So let's make sure we're using, that's one of the first things we do at our clinic is we, we let them use their skills. And then number two, we are going to need to pay them more. And it, it really does vary regionally. Um, but we really need to start looking at not only paying them more, but also giving more benefits. So a lot of techs, what's important to them is CE. So the more CE you can give them, that is really important. And then the other thing is they really are looking for a good quality of, of life work balance. So giving them vacation, giving them two weeks instead of one, you know, making sure that you're getting them out there on time and you're not burning them out. A lot of them are interested in four day work weeks or three day work weeks instead of five. So those are some really things that we can look at as well. But we really do need to look and pay. I mean, a lot of times I see tech starting out at $13 an hour and we really need to up that. I mean, that needs to be, you know, 15, 19 in terms of where we're looking. But that's also hard for groups when, when budgeting is an issue. So you always have to weigh those. But look at other benefits you can give if you can't do pay. Fantastic. Great. Do you think a cat-only clinic has any disadvantages? I think, yes. I, I think uh, the sustainability. Because... Um, while you can do more, which is great, and they're, the vets, they're easier to do, so the vets like doing them more, um, dogs is where you can really make a lot of the money that helps subsidize. So when you're doing cats only, it is a little bit harder to be able to sustain that. So you do have to either look for subsidies, or you're going to have to do more, or you're going to have to find some other way to bring in revenue. So I do think it is a um, challenge on that sense, um, but not in terms of the actual operation, just in terms of the financial. But you can still do it. You can do either an all cat or if you do dogs, you can still do a lot of clinics do 70 percent cats, 30 percent dogs are still 60. So you can still do a majority cats. Um, so you're still feeling like you're serving the need. Um, in the two clinics that you are involved with, um, how does the pricing compare to like retail in that area? Is it 75 percent? Is it 30 percent? You know, how, what what's the ratio there? So a couple of things. So when I do a nonprofit, it's different. I'm definitely doing that lower. So that, that answer would be different on how I'd answer a spay neuter clinic. Um, and I can definitely get pricing on that if somebody wants. But on this, which is a full service model, so we're doing everything. We're an actual private practice for profit. We make sure our vaccine prices and wellness prices match the low clinics, like the VIPs, the pet IQ. Ours are actually a little bit lower than theirs. And then our, our regular pricing is generally about 30% below market value. Now, there are some things that we might come in at the exact same on with people, um, with other clinics, but in general, it tends to be that. But our big thing is not so much, yes, we do keep the pricing in a certain piece, but our big thing is the financial triage. That's the big thing I want to get across to people is it's, it's meeting people where they're at. If they get turned down from care credit, we have scratch pay. If they're turned down from scratch pay, we have vet billing. If they're turned down from that, we have a stay together fund. We have the Humane Society. So it's really having options beyond just this is our price or this is care credit that's really important. Um, okay, that's fantastic. Um, let's see. You had touched upon this with regards to the veterinary shortage. Um, all right. You okay? So the training for nonprofits that is 
pending or up and coming if people are interested in finding yeah, out how no, to work with you, you can just they, they can email me yes we've already started that so right now we are doing everything virtual um just because of of covid but eventually it will be um on site as well but right now it is virtual but we're finding we can still do a lot so we'll look at what depending on what you need, we can either look at your floor plans, we can look at your budgeting, we can look at your flow and efficiency. And I have myself, a veterinarian and a tech. So we kind of have all sides of that, the admin, the medical support and the, the veterinary. So. If you were a group and you were thinking about putting a clinic together, um, you know, what sort of money would we be talking about the, you know, having to raise to sort of invest in a project like this? So if you're talking about a spay neuter clinic or do you do you think they meant uh the model that that you're talking about okay. right now so if you're doing a full service the equipment itself is going to be around two hundred fifty thousand because you're going to have to get digital x-ray dental x-ray things like that um and then it's going to be whatever your building is so i'm generally telling people it's going to be around 500 to possibly more depending on your building and renovations and how quickly you can start up so it is definitely a big investment but again if you have that or you have an investor it is worth it in the end and it can be sustainable so what i'm thinking too is if you did this like as your for-profit model and had it spin off cash to investors but also to the nonprofit, right could it be a revenue generator for your nonprofit if your nonprofit does rescue which tends to not be very revenue generating um you know so is there a way or or does the practice just reinvest in itself yeah we're seeing a lot of people who are using kind of wellness or are doing additional services to help offset you do have to be careful between a for-profit and a nonprofit that it's not seen as your for-profit is just there for your nonprofit. Um, a lot of people have gotten in trouble for that where they have you, you can't just raise funds to make it look like it's for yourself if that makes sense that for your own benefit um, so you have to be a little careful in terms of the law there, but yes, that you can work in, in joint together. And again, if you don't have both, but you just have one partner with a private practice and like Ashley Humane partners with us, they didn't run their own clinic and we didn't decide to start our own nonprofit. It's just, it's a great thing. If you don't have that, you might look at it, but first look to see what exists because you might not have to do it all. Right. I mean, they're, they're, you're providing your customer base right there. So, yeah. you know, talk about not having to do a lot of marketing to get going and all that kind of stuff too. You, you come in with, um, you can basically ramp up, um, you warm up, you, your soft open is actually pretty hard because you've already got people waiting at the door, yeah. put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and it makes us feel good because we know there are people who really need our help. Um, you know, because a lot of times our clients are people who've never been to a vet before, or they've waited until it's a full mouth extraction or the skin issues are so bad. And a lot of people think, oh, this is cruelty. It's not cruelty. They just didn't have access. So we have to really differentiate that between intentional cruelty. And I, I really want to do the right thing. I just didn't have the funds. And that's what we're trying to help. Right. If, if you had a magical wand and you could do whatever, whatever you wanted, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm sort of thinking, okay, well, so we should take this list of like the, the counties in the United States that have like, you know, the, the lowest, um, or the highest euthanasia rates or the lowest save rates, however you want to reference it, you know, and maybe we just like talk, start at the top of the list and start putting those clinics in those communities and work our way down. I mean, would that be a decent strategy? I think one of the biggest challenges is that we have a lot of vet deserts. So there's actually 1.5 million people who are not covered. There, there are areas where there's just not a vet in four counties over. So the first thing is trying to figure out, and we also know that there tend to be vet deserts in underserved communities or more communities of color. Um, so we really have to first look at, um, can we, where, where are where are those because that's going to be a really big issue is where the vet deserts are and but we so we kind of need to lay everything over you need to lay over your social determinants you need to lay over where the highest intake in euthanasia is you need to lay over um you know all all these sorts of things together and yes i think being a very strategic move is very important we also have to look at where do vets want to go because i'll be honest with you vets do not want to come to toledo ohio and it is very hard for us to find a vet so you do have to be prepared for that as well as can you even find veterinarians if you're really going into a very rural area 
But one of the things we can do is if you create some in urban areas, you can then provide services for counties all around you and make it a regional approach with one clinic. So that's kind of a nice option that we can look at as well. So I definitely think that we need to be strategic in where we're putting these, these clinics, but we also are gonna to need to look at how, we're not gonna be able to do one in every small area, so how can we create regional-based ones? Do you know of any initiatives that are helping to increase the number of veterinarians that will be coming online? Are, are we trying to grow that community? Yes, thank goodness. There's a lot of thought on that now because Banfield's estimating that there's going to be a shortage of 10,000 veterinarians over the next 10 years. And that means 75 million pets could be going without care. That is a very scary statistic. So there are a lot of people, including the vet schools, including large corporations like Banfield and, and uh, VCA that are really looking into this, as well as the national organizations, the nonprofits. So we're all really starting to look at this and try to figure out options. So right now, short term is how do we get more veterinarians into shelter medicine, spay neuter and, and access to care that exist? And then long term is how do we grow more? Well, and also let's look at what our veterinary technicians are doing and see maybe if there's more that they can do. I mean, it still drives me crazy that a veterinarian has to give a rabies vaccine. So there's you know, interesting work on that being done right now. There's there's a couple of places that are are looking at could they increase and look more to human medicine model of how do we start to um, get you know physicians assistance or how do we get uh, you know some of the other the the other um, roles they have to increase because that would also potentially bring up the rates for techs. It would give them an opportunity to grow and make more money. So there's definitely that. And I think the other thing that I'm really excited, which James and Kara is working on, is getting more veterinarians of color into this field because it is still a very white field. And I think that we have a huge untapped population there that maybe is that we have never really reached out to as well. So I think there's some really interesting work being done on that end. Right. And my other my other thing too, as some certified vet techs in some states, I think are allowed to do cat neuters, right? It, um, it, yeah. And then other, it's not a, some it's, it's being done, but it, should not be <laughs> oh, so good. but but so I, there's there's some real discussion about what they should do and what they shouldn't and how do we get vet associations and vet boards involved so i'm excited because they're getting the right people at the table to do it and i think that's one of the biggest things about this is we can't do this all alone we need to start thinking outside of just ourselves and how do we bring in other people and so whether it's in the human health care it's the private practice it's the nonprofits. That's what excites me most about the field right now is that we're really starting to think outside ourselves. Uh, people are interested in understanding how are you able to keep those prices around 30% less um, compared to other clinics. Um, in addition to staffing costs, there's also costs of you know materials and drugs and you know all your day-to-day -day stuff. Do you have any special tips and tricks with regards to that? I mean, our big thing, and this is something we go over all in our mentoring in detail, but our inventory, we don't keep a lot of inventory on site. We use a lot of our online pharmacy. We do a lot of only ordering what we need type of things versus so we might only have three types of flea and tick versus seven, you know, what other clinics may offer. Um, we don't do the higher end type of things. You know, we refer out for ultrasounds. So um, things like that, but we do a lot of the, the incremental care allows us to do that. Um, we do a lot of scripting out. We do a lot of really looking at our financials. We are constantly looking at our cost of goods. We're constantly looking at our labor. We're constantly looking at our inventory costs and keeping them at a set price. That is one of the most important things we can do. Inventory is what tends to get out of control the most. Um, and we are always looking at our pricing. You know, there are some times when we are going to not be lower or you know but we really try to take the biggest areas that we know that people are looking for or have the biggest need and make those lower excellent all right well um and i can't believe we had this conversation without even mentioning covid <laughs> oh thank goodness I, i'd like to not think about it first because i feel like that's all i think about all day long is yeah running any type of veterinary care right now in covid it is insane it, it is busier than ever and I, I mean, I don't, people don't know when it's going to end and everybody is stressed to the max. So I think mental health is super important right now. Yeah, excellent. Amy, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you uh, spending your Sunday morning with us. And um, thank you so much. And it's a great lead in. If folks are really interested in continuing spay new conversation, we're going to have the United Spay Alliance online conference February 26th to 28th. And that's 
basically 48 hours of talking about spay neuter for the whole weekend. So it's like a whole, it's a spay a thon, but in a different way. And <laughs> so uh, if you really want to continue this conversation, we'll be taking it over there. We'll have Dr. Bushby, who you mentioned earlier, he'll be uh, presenting at that conference. And um, this is just a little flavor of what, what will be going on, but we want to bring spay neuter back to the top of the pile on, on these conversations. So Amy, thank you again for joining us. Really appreciate it.